Countdown to kickoff, heading out to Pittsburgh with Jory Rand of KDKA News. And the Pittsburgh Steelers, they got the coach, they got the quarterback, Super Bowl Bowl appearance last year fell short in a tough game. How hungry are these players to make it back there and win it? I'd say about as, as hungry as you can be. Uh, we caught up with several players throughout the off season, and every time we talked to them, they said that that game just kind of stuck with them. Even guys who have been here for both of the Steelers' recent Super Bowl championships, they have two rings. And uh, midsummer, uh, they said it still kind of burns at them. Um, so a lot of these guys aren't used to getting to that stage and losing. It was the first time it had happened uh, in a long time to this franchise, and I think it's eaten at a lot of guys, and uh, they're ready to get back. How's Marquise Pouncey coming along? <laughs> Physically or developmentally? <laughs> Why don't you give me both? Well, developmentally, he was ready before uh, he even arrived. Um, this is a guy who, who last season was going to be mixed in at offensive guard until the coaches got a look at him in week two of the preseason and realized what they had on their hands. And they got rid of their starting center, Justin Hartwig, who uh, started in the last Super Bowl win, knowing that they had their center for the next 10 to 15 years. So developmentally, he's fine. Physically, uh, it's another story. He, he, you know, he injured his ankle last season, wasn't able to play in the Super Bowl, re-injured it in this preseason, and it said it's going to be a season-long lingering kind of injury, so he's never going to beat 100%. But at this point, 85 90% of Marquise Pouncey is better than anybody else that could be out there. And so he'll be, he'll be out there, he'll tough it through, and as long as he can stand, he'll play. And I think uh, the Steelers should be just fine, especially given their history of having porous offensive lines. That's not really so much an area of worry, especially with Ben Roethlisberger as their quarterback. Heinz Ward has been with the team for such a long time. It seems as though he, he will get his touches, but he is that aging wide receiver on the Steelers roster. How many more good years do you think he has left? Do, how many do I think or how many do, does Heinz think? I think he, he'll tell you he can go at least you know, two, three, four more. I'd say, you know, this is the twilight of his career. I think even he would admit that. But they've been saying he's been too old for a couple of years now. And he just said this week that this is what he thrives off of, uh, is people doubting him. It's what he's gone off his entire career. He's too small. He's not fast enough. And, and all he's done is, is taken the, the Steelers franchise lead in receptions, yards, and touchdowns for a receiver. And when you look at the history of this franchise, they got a couple Hall of Famers in uh, Swan and Stallworth back from the 70s, and, and Hines has passed them in basically every offensive statistical category. Um, I, I think he'll be fine, but the important thing is that the, the Steelers have – depth and speed at wide receiver this year, so even if Hines isn't at the level we're used to seeing him at, um, they'll be able to keep going. And Mike Wallace was a third-round draft pick a couple of years ago out of Old Miss. He's come on and replaced Antonio Holmes, hasn't missed a beat. And then these two young guys who were drafted last year, Antonio Brown and Emmanuel Sanders, just came onto the scene like gangbusters. And, and uh, I mean, Antonio Brown is on the cusp of becoming a, a household name and an NFL superstar. This guy is so strong and so fast on his feet. And then you have Emmanuel Sanders, who might be technically a better wide receiver. So you look at this wide receiver core, and they're, they're deep and they're fast. And with Heinz Ward in there, uh, you know, they're a, he's a veteran presence on this team, and he's the one going around telling all these young guys, you may not get the ball in your hands, you may not get as many touches as you're used to getting, only because there's so much talent in this receiver core, and you have to be willing to give it up to the betterment of the team. And I think he might be speaking for himself, realizing that he, his best days are behind him. But we're also talking about a guy who was one reception off the team lead again last year. He's played, I think, 12 years and has led the team in reception almost every year. I, I'll have to check the numbers, but I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it's all but one. Um, so he's he still got it. How long he has it, you know, we'll wait and see that. But as of this year, I think it's safe to say he's still got it. Here's a celebrity question, you could say, from the guy who runs things around here, Jank Uger. Is the offensive line the weakest spot on this team, he asked you? Well, you tell Jank, who I'm a big fan of for many years now, you tell Jank that no, um, the offensive line is not the weakest spot. And, and even if it were, it has been in the past, even if it were, it wouldn't matter. Ben Roethlisberger is the kind of quarterback that doesn't need a whole lot of protection because he makes so many plays with his legs and with his arm. He mo he's almost better when he's on the run. He, you know, he, he makes so many things happen. The weakest spot on this team, and if you saw the game against 
New England last year, and if you saw the Super Bowl against Green Bay last year, if you saw the game on Halloween night in New Orleans, the, the weakness on this team is the secondary. Um, even with Troy Polamalu, guaranteed Hall of Famer back there, the cornerbacks on this team can be a liability at times. And they say no team is technically perfect across the board. Every team has to have a weakness. You can't have all pro players at every position. And, and for the Steelers, this is it. They just re-signed Ike Taylor um, to a, basically another franchise deal. He gets a lot of money, and he's their best cornerback. And a lot of people say he's not, you know what, a, a true number one quarterback. I think people here would disagree with that. But after Ike Taylor, there's not a whole lot. There's not a whole lot behind him. And uh, some teams, if you have the quarterback, you can pick apart this defense, and that's the only way to beat this defense. Because against the run, they're one of the best in the history of the game, and they have been for at least the last five years. And so it's those elite quarterbacks that can pick them apart. So you tell Jank, the offensive line has its problems, but it doesn't even matter. It's the secondary that's gonna you know, sink this team if it happens. We could agree that rivalries are what makes sports. This opening week of the NFL season, Pittsburgh and Baltimore collide. How big of a rivalry is this to open up the season? People around here will tell you it's the biggest in the NFL, and I think some people nationally wouldn't disagree with that. you got a couple more, and you're seeing a pretty good one. Rivalries can kind of come and go, especially with the parity in the NFL and the ebb and flow of different teams. But right now, I'd say Baltimore-Pittsburgh is one of, if not, the best, um, you know. But it's uh, recently it's been kind of a, a one-sided thing. You know, we, we talked about it earlier this week here in town. The, the Steelers view the Ravens as their chief rival, as they should be. The Ravens view the Steelers as the lone reason why they haven't won a Super Bowl in a decade. They, the Steelers are that hump in the road that the Ravens just cannot get over. There was a time when Terrell Suggs wouldn't say the name Steelers or say the city. Pittsburgh, you would just say that team, and everyone knew who he was talking about. <laughs> I mean, the Steelers really are the thorn in the Ravens' side. They, they just can't get over that hump. And even when, when you win in the regular season like the Ravens were able to do last season, you could say Ben Roethlisberger wasn't playing. I think Joe Flacco is 0-6 in his career in games against the Steelers in which Ben Roethlisberger plays. And so this is the game that all the Steelers get up for. This week is different here. This week feels different here. You go in the locker room. And uh, it's a different vibe. And Heinz Ward has been talking since training camp opened about a month ago that he, he wasn't thinking about any of the preseason games. All he was thinking about was Baltimore. Now, part of that is because it's week one of the season. But another part is these two teams know that they're going to be facing each other for the next decade and maybe for as long as these two franchises are around. Mike Tomlin, head coach of the Steelers, said earlier this week, these two teams have the same goal every year. It's to win the AFC North. Ultimately, they have the same goal of winning the Super Bowl and know that the road has to go through each other's cities to get there. And uh, recently, the Steelers have had the advantage, but some of these games have been so close where it could have gone either way, and both teams know that. It's part of what makes it so good. Lastly for you, Jory, over under 10.5 wins this year for Pittsburgh. <laughs> i I got to go over. I mean, you take a look at their schedule and you take a look at who they're returning. Um, the Steelers had the least turnover of anyone in the NFL, and I guess the flip side of that is they have the oldest defense in the NFL by two years, so it's not exactly like they're spring chickens out there. Um, but I, I just can't see them getting less. I mean, 11 at a minimum. Um, I, I would I would predict 12 and 4. You're going to have some slip-ups around here, but I say Pittsburgh and New England are the class of the AFC as of right now until further notice, and I don't see them winning less than 11. I'm calling 12 for the season.